Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mark chapter 4. A lot of verses here, so we're going to start with me and we'll go around here to this layer. All right? 4.1. And he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. 2. Then he taught them many things by parables, and said to them in his teaching, Uh, pass. Three. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Oh, it's <laughs> five. Do you want to read? Our yeah. Oh. yeah, five. Okay. Some fell on stony ground <clears throat> where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, and because it had no depth of earth. Six, but when the sun came out, the plants were <clears throat> scorched and they withered because they had no root. Seven, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Eight, and other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some and and. Uh, uh, nine, and he was saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Ten, when he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about the parable. <clears throat> Eleven, he told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that. Twelve. Pass me. <laughs> Continue. So that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, mm -hmm. and, e and even hearing, but never understanding. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Mm -hmm. 13. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Oh. 15. 14. 14. 14. <laughs> the sower sows the word. Short one. 15. <laughs> some, people like, some people are like seed along the path where the wor word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that, is, that was sown <coughs> in them. 16. Others like seed sown in rocky place, places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. 17, but since they... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was ready. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's your turn. 17, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Eighteen, still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word. Nineteen, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Twenty, and these, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit some thirty-fold, some sixty, and some and under. Twenty-one, and he was saying to them, A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket. It is, or under a bed. Oh, is it? And or under a bed. It is not brought to be put out. Is it not brought to be put on the lamp sand? Twenty-two, for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Mm -hmm. Twenty-three, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Go ahead. Consider care, or number 24. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. 25, for through the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. 26, and he said, 
The kingdom of heaven is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. 27. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though the others, uh, though he does not know how. 28. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. 29. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. 30. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? 31. It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. 32. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. 33. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it. 34. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But he, when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. 36. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were, there were also other boats with him. 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. 38. But he was in the stern, uh, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? 39. <clears throat> he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Qu Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. 40. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? 41. And they feared exceedingly <coughs> and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Mm. All right. So what's the kind of literature there? Yeah. It's a narrative. Mm -hmm. And embedded in the narrative are what? Parables. Parables. Okay. Good. Uh, without counting... Things in the parables as characters. How many? <laughs> Let's name the characters. God. God. Yep. Literally. Literally. Yeah. Literally. Yep. Literally. Yep. This yep. time, literally. The disciples. The disciples. Jesus. 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 And the crowds. So that's basically the three. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so again, again with the gospels, you'll find a lot of similar materials. So that's why you'll read about some of these parables in the other gospels. And again, some, every once in a while, you'll run across some kind of post or some kind of thing saying, they took these verses out of the Bible. <coughs> well, what's real, a more accurate description is, is that um, people study these, these manuscripts and uh, they try to find the earliest manuscripts <coughs> that they believe are the most reliable. So over time, a scribe is copying some of these things, and he might uh, some some of these things that he's copying might ring a bell in his ear, and he accidentally puts a little extra words from another gospel in. Okay, but at the end of the day, um, when new and it's mostly newer versions, um, when when you find verses that might be missing in the newer versions from, say, the King James, there's no grand conspiracy where somebody's trying to denigrate Jesus and take out verses from the Bible. It's just that you've already assumed that what usually what's happened is you've already assumed that whatever the King James says is the definitive version. <laughs> so yes, compared to the King James, some verses are taken out. But if this theory is correct, they shouldn't have been in the King James this way anyway. So anyway, I just just if you ever run across something like that, that's what's going on. Um, and again, um, there are diff these different symbols have been associated with the different Gospels over the years. 
And so Mark is a winged lion, which is why that's the main graphic there. Okay, so um, if you were to say, I, I would break this up into two big sections. That's what I would do. Now, the first section would have a couple of subsections, but if you're going to break it up into two big sections, what would you call them? Parables of the sower. Parables? And not just the parable of the sower, but parables, oh, right? Parables. There's a string of parables. Okay. Yeah. okay. There's a string of parables, and we'll, we can subdivide those eventually. And then what's, what's, what's there there near the end? Jesus comes the storm. Yeah, so... So there are parables and what, what you might call a nature miracle, right? Or a miracle, or Jesus calming the storm. So let's, let's uh, take a look here at the, this section of the parable stuff, okay? Um, before we get into the parable stuff, the actual parable, well, uh, let's, let's look from 1 to 9, okay? What's going on there in 1 to 9? The four soil. Yeah, he's, he, he, one of the things is all these crowds, remember the crowds were going out from Jerusalem to John in the wilderness. Here we've got these crowds coming to Jesus beside the sea and he's not, I don't remember where he is, but he's not right beside the temple. The point is, is that Jesus is gaining this notoriety outside the accepted realms of, of you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees yeah. basically, right? So these crowds are coming out, and he gets in a boat and goes, has it go out a little ways. So the further out he got, the easier it is for people to hear him ostensibly, right? Okay, so he's teaching them things in parables. And what, how, does, how does this first parable start out? The listen, very first I'm one. Listen. Listen. Oh, listen. Yeah. How does it end? All those who have ears here, let them hear. Okay, listen up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the implication, is this a take it or leave it proposition from Jesus? Is this a, you should really think about this sometime? Oh. No. I heard one guy talk about, um, he was doing his PhD work in Britain. And the difference between PhD work in America and the PhD work in Britain is that the American advisor, that's the person who's overseeing your paper, will say, you need to do this, 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 and this. In Britain, because they're a little bit more reserved, he would say, you should consider. But when he says you should consider, he really means you should do this, right? So that's the impetus here. Jesus isn't saying, ah, take it or leave it. He's saying, listen up, okay? Unclog your ears. And he tells this parable or a story. Okay, and summarize the story there. It, just the story part, not the interpretation part. Oh, it's a, about a farmer that's sowing seed. Okay, farmer sowing seed. Uh, if you live in the loop in Chicago, is this gonna gonna make sense to you? <clears throat> No, if you live downstate, this might make sense to you, right? Okay? So these are, these are points of contact that Jesus has with his hearers, especially when, you know, they were closer to their food chain than we certainly are, right? Okay? But even the city folks can understand this. It's sure. pretty basic, like sure. a child could understand. Pretty it's much. pretty basic. It is basic enough, right? It's, it's inter- I think it's interesting, though. He calls him a farmer, but... What farmer would sow, would sow a seed like that? I mean, normally a farmer clears a patch of ground and, you know, plows it or whatever and then the sows the seed. Thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, this the guy's just throwing it around. <laughs> These were the days before Monsanto, right? Monsanto, the seed company that, you know, engineers the seeds so that you have to buy it from them and then... Once your harvest comes, you can't keep some back and actually use the new ones. You have to keep buying more seed from Monsanto or whoever the company is, right? And back before they had the means to do things super duper efficiently, if you've ever seen anybody, you know, you've seen people plant things where they've got this little machine that pokes a single hole and a single seed goes in it and a, the, the efficient distance is measured, then the thing pokes a hole again and 
But that's not what this guy's doing. What's he doing? Just it. <laughs> Hitching it. Okay. Now some of this is in some of the things that said that, you know, some that fell along the path that that even the feet coming by and tromping on it would till it a little bit, right? <clears throat> but the sower is indiscriminate. So this isn't, he's not teaching. One of the things that sometimes people do is they'll say, well, Jesus is teaching people how to farm. That's not what he's teaching here, right? Okay? It seems like whenever Jesus uh, um, tells up a parable of some sort, he brings the subject down to the people that they know all about. For instance, like farming, you put the seed in, you get a hundred in return. Yep. There's so many parables that um, that people are associated with everyday life. Yep. So these are, you know, he's not going to have to do five minutes of setting this up, right? Once he says something, everybody's going to click, right? Okay. So the sower is just. Sowing. Some fell along the path, and what happened to the path seeds? Birds ate it. Birds ate it. Some fell on the rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. What happens to it? Well, the soil is so hard that the seed can't penetrate it. Okay. So it, it springs up a little bit, and it had no depth or root, so it withers away when the sun came. Uh, verse 7, some fell among the thorns... What happened to it? Yeah, it's like uh, if you've ever been in the South, kudzu just takes on everything, right? Kudzu just my garden. <laughs> it's in your garden here. You have kudzu. Oh, you're saying this like your garden? Yeah. yeah. Just come into my yard and yep. check my garden. Yep. So when when some plants grow up, they can choke out the other plants because it takes up the sun and the nutrients and all that stuff. And what happens to the last group? Good good soil. Good, good soil. Good Into soil. good soil, produced grain, and increased yielding 30, 60, and 100. Yeah. I don't know that even on our super efficient planting and seed making abilities, if anybody guarantees that this seed will go 100%, right? right? But, so you've got this sower coming. He just throws the seed out. And there are kind of four responses to this. There are four things that happen with the seeds where it falls. But again, the sower is doing what? Just throwing it out. Throwing it out. Throwing it out. Okay? So that's the setup. What happens from 10 to 20 there? The disciples didn't understand it. <laughs> the disciples didn't understand it. Okay? Do you suppose if the disciples didn't get it, do you suppose the people did? Great question. What do you think? Some did. Some did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, maybe the seed fell on some rocky soil with the crowd. Maybe some fell on good soil. Right? Think about that. But the point is, they come and they ask Jesus. And it's always, that's never... The bad, that's never the wrong thing to do. Right? When you don't know. It's never the wrong thing to do. Why? Number one, he might actually answer. Number two, as soon as you think it, the Lord knows that you're thinking it. That's the thing about prayer, right? You're not having any thoughts that your Lord's not seeing, which is scary, right? <laughs> Okay, so it's always a good thing to ask Jesus. And as a matter of fact, during the, in the Psalms, when they're at their wit's end, they say, how long, O Lord? How long? How long? Why do the wicked prosper? Why do my enemies seem like they're uh, coming to get me? I've, I've eaten my tears for breakfast. Um, why have you hidden your face? It's, it's, it, Jesus' shoulders are super broad. and He can handle it. Okay, so they come and they ask him, and what does he say there? Eleven to thirteen. Whew. The secret of kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those that outside everything is said in parable, 
this was said in Isaiah, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving. Yeah. So he says, you've been given the secret, and then he tells them what it means, right? But for those outside, everything is in parables. So sometimes we say that Jesus put the cookies on the low shelf so everybody would get it. What does Jesus actually say here the reason that he spoke in parables was? Those who hear will hear. Those who don't hear will not hear. Mm -hmm. We bend over backwards to make things as accessible as possible. And we're rightly, rightly we should do that. We should remove all the barriers we can Mm -hmm. to people coming to the Lord. However, he here said, I speak in parables because some people are going to get it. And some people who think they should get it aren't going to get it. And he quotes this thing from Isaiah 6, 9 to 11, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there. You'll remember Isaiah 6 is where Isaiah is coming in. He comes into the temple and he sees the Lord and his train fills the temple. And he says, I'm undone. I live among a people of unclean lips. And this angel brings a hot coal and cleanses Isaiah's lips. Right? Cleanses of them as sin. And the Lord says, who will go for us? I'll go. Here's what's going to happen when you go. You're going to talk to my people and they're not going to hear you. And I don't think that Isaiah was the only prophet that was told that. right? Maybe Jeremiah was too. I'm not sure. You can check me. But we have this tendency to think, you know, because we think that the main problem in the world is that people don't have the right information. That's how we act. If they just understood this, if they just had this piece of information, then everything would be whatever. That's not how it really works. It's good to have the good information, but so the Lord says, I'm going to send you, and you're going to speak, and some are going to hear, some are not going to hear. I speak in parables because... Some will hear and some will not hear. Now, if you connect that to the parable, I don't think it's right to say 25%. There are four kinds of soil. I don't think it's right for us to say each soil gets 25%. That's what we would want to do in our Monsanto efficiency, right? We'd want to make the, the spreadsheet work really well. But a lot of people, three categories don't persevere. One category does. Okay, So, while the Lord Jesus has His roster of His sheep, and everyone on His roster will show up with His robe of righteousness on, our job is to spread the seed. And again, we don't get to decide where we should throw the seed. That's why I ask that the Lord would make me as bold in witnessing to non-Jehovah's Witnesses as I am witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not that I think that non-Jehovah's Witnesses shouldn't be witnessed to. It's just I'm more comfortable because at least with Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to talk with you about the Bible. You just go up to some normal person and you don't have that huge overlap of understanding, right? Okay, so he says, and, and I, think, um, I think Isaiah 6 is quoted six times total in the New Testament. Okay? And so he gives them the understanding of the parable. And so uh, what, are the, what happens with the four types of soil? I mean, it's almost, it's almost as if when you start looking at the description and the explanation, that the explanation, like there's this interplay between them. Like Jesus almost couldn't have, you know, he almost might, he almost didn't even need to give them the explanation because or maybe it's because I've already read the explanation that when I see the description, I automatically fill that in, right? That could be it too. All right, so what happens with the first soil there in 15? Sown among the path. Some people are like seeds. Same, perhaps. 
Satan, Satan comes. comes. So what's the uh, so look look back up at the at the actual parable. What's what's the corresponding thing to Satan? The birds, right? Okay. So there's a little bit of a connection there. So, But not every time you see the red sandhill crane should you say, red, Satan, devil, <laughs> just outside, right? Don't do that, okay? So Satan comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Now, given what Jesus has also taught about the human heart, it will not do to say it was only Satan. I think Satan here is certainly the fallen angel Satan, but it's also our human nature, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's how I would say it, right? Okay. Uh, who was it? Was it Geraldine who always said that the devil made oh, me do yeah, it? Right. Flip yeah. Wilson? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the devil made you. And also you are a very willing accomplice, right? Okay. So, uh, sown on the path, they hear. Satan immediately comes, takes away the word that is sown in them. How about the rocky ground? They're in 16 and 17. Well, they think it's a good thing, but they don't last very long. They don't last very long. Man, if something hard comes around, yeah, yeah, they receive it with joy, but since it has no depth, it will endure for a while, just like a little weed that comes up through the sidewalk. Right, the sun comes down and burns right up. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So this might be somebody who, you know, has some kind of experience where they feel that the Lord has gotten a hold of them, and then the first time somebody looks sideways at them, they're like, "Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take this abuse for my faith." So maybe it's not a big deal after all. Okay. When you analyze the root of a uh, of a a plant, that's the vital portion of it. If you don't have that. The root is good. The, the plant will never survive. As a matter of, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, a carrot is mostly root, <laughs> right? Mm. And maybe potatoes. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not. My I don't have a very green thumb. So sometimes I see that when someone first becomes well, except to God decided if they to really become a poor again Christian, but it's more of an emotion based decision, and and then. They just fizzle out soon after, and you know, and sometimes they get great enthusiasm at the beginning, and, and they're, they're buying all these books and reading their Bible, and and, and and like you said, as soon as you know adversity hits or the next cool thing that comes along, they just yeah fade off. And uh, a few years ago, Kanye West, rapper from Chicago. Uh, made a profession of faith, and people people online were like, "Sure, hope he means it." And people were like, "How dare you say?" I mean, there was you know, there's both sides, but again, you have to wait, to see when persecution arises, and you know, it's a long haul thing. Now, if you just took a snapshot, if you just took one Polaroid of Peter after he had denied Jesus, you'd say he's lost. But if you take a bunch of snapshots there. Eventually, well, Jesus says, your, your faith won't fail because I prayed for you, right? So again, you just need to be cautious, okay? So uh, that's why when Kanye West says he's a Christian, I didn't try to call him and ask if he would teach Sunday school. <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, would that he would study and learn to teach, right? But, you know, the Scriptures tell us to not lay hands hastily on an elder, okay? All right. Uh, the third soil, sown among thorns there in 18 and 19. Care of the world, deceitful, deceitfulness of riches and the desires. So the one soil, the, the, the bird, Satan bird takes it away. The next soil, persecution arises on account of the word. This one almost seems like a distraction, right? Just, eh, it's not really all that important. I've got a, I bought a field, and I got to go look at it. I've, I've just taken a wife, and I must. That's from another parable, right? Okay. <clears throat> Choke out the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were on, sown on the good soil are ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, 
and then different variances of fruit yielding. Okay. To my knowledge, there's no description of how you become a different soil. How would you refer that to a family and the head of a family who doesn't have the soil to propagate the right kind of uh, um, uh, strength that's needed for the family? Well, certainly uh, heads of families are, are, are uh, responsible for what goes on in their family. Where would you get the soil if you were the head of the family? <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask the Lord to do this. Because it's not automatic. It's not automatic. Um, I think be, you'd have to pray for the Holy Spirit because He's the one ultimately that, that is the right soil. If the Holy Spirit will um, change a person, then He could be that last group where He makes 30 or 60 or 100 fold, you know, from that seed, but it takes God Himself to do it, ultimately. Like Jesus said earlier, you know, he who has ears to hear, so they, they, they're missing something, those people that are not getting the Gospel, that are not, you know, it's, it's their fault, basically, and ultimately, but it's also God, if God wanted to, He could change a rock to become a Christian if He wanted to. Like, you know. <laughs> Yeah, the, you know, he could change uh, the the worst pro Hitler, the worst person on earth. He could change yeah, if he wanted to. Yeah. Heads of families are to sow, sow the seed, sow the seed. So you pray for them. You pray for them. And you persevere. And you persevere. Yeah, right. So that's you know. So you've got um, in the first soil, the the it didn't even get a chance to sprout. The the bird devil comes. Middle two soils, it sprouts a little bit, but does not last. Fourth soil sprouts deep fruitfulness. Okay, So it's clear which one we want to be. It's clear which one we want everybody else we know to be. Okay, So that's, that's, the, the, thing about, that's the thing about the parable. Jesus tells it. The disciples come to him. What does this mean, Jesus? Here's what it means. And so he tells them. He tells them, I'm, I'm telling you because the kingdom is given to you, not to those people who don't need a physician. He would use that in other places, right? The well do not need a doctor. And part of their fact, part of the reason that people will not be on board with him is because they don't see their need for him. And that happened on a large scale in his ministry right then and there. Right. Okay, so I've given you a little bit here on this sheet. Um, there are people that study just the Gospels, and then there are people that specialize in just the parables. Okay, so there's all sorts of resources for people with parables. Um, I've given you just a few little bit interpretive guidelines. This is an article from R.C. Sproul. Uh, so I... These are not my words. Um, number one, don't treat parables like an allegory. Okay? So an allegory, so when you read through these parables, um, allegory is kind of a, some of the early church fathers were into allegory. Uh, most often completely filled with symbolic meaning. Every detail means something that can be traced to the overriding principle that is being illuminated. Here's the example. The early church father, Augustine, he, his exposition of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho? Well, that was Adam. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem, the heavenly city of peace from which Adam fell or was ejected. Jericho was the moon, signifying Adam's mortality. The robbers, the devil and his angels, stripped him of his, what? His immortality, beat him by persuading him to sin, leaving him half dead. So, Augustine looked into the parable of the Good Samaritan and assigned every detail to something else. Okay? This is what I would call the maximalist version. It seems to be a little much. So, for instance, um, let's see, down there, bandaged his wounds, binding the restraint of sin, oil, comfort of good hope, uh, wine, put him on the donkey, the flesh of Christ's incarnation, took him to the inn, which is the church, 
The next day after the resurrection, two, two silver coins, promise of his life and the life to come. The innkeeper in Augustine's mind was the Apostle Paul. So he's a maximalist. Every single little detail is going to get attached to some other piece of information. Well, I think that's, it's, it's, it's a little much. So you can have your ears listening when you, when you start, when, when people are preaching through parables, you can say, well, this, is, this kind of feels like he's allegorizing just a little bit here. And obviously this one with Augustine is the biggest example. Um, every detail means something that can be traced to the overriding principle that is being illuminated. And uh, Sproul's opinion here is that parables usually have one basic central meaning. Trying to over-symbolize them can have the effect of tearing them apart. A person doesn't understand the beauty of a flower by disassembling it. <laughs> right? It's, uh, you know, you analyze the thing to death and you, you can't, can't see the forest for the trees. Okay? Like a blossom, a parable is best understood by seeing a simple and profound entirety. Then um, Sproul suggests that there's a rule of three, like all good storytelling parables usually follow the rule of three, kind of three points. Uh, but also, some parable scholars say it's probably just one point. So again, don't want to make a super hard and fast rule. It's clear probably that Augustine's version of allegorizing and there's a, everything is everything all the time is probably too much. Okay. Uh, number three on the back page, the rule of two. Parable characters often follow the rule of two. There are usually two people who experience tension between righteousness and sin, good and evil. So... Uh, you remember the the, uh, the parable about the tax collector and the Pharisee that went up to the temple to pray? Mm -hmm. So there's two contrasting examples, right? The Pharisee was self-righteous, the tax collector, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. So look for those contrasts. And then code words and phrases. Um, for instance, uh, he says, how much more, or the kingdom of of God is like, or he who has ears calls people to critically important issues. Verily, verily, I say to you. So that's just a little, little itty bitty bit about reading through the parables. Um, I will also say that, that if you ever come across a parable, that sometimes it is about his, Jesus' ministry and the rejection of him. So there's a parable that he tells about a man owned a vineyard and he leased it to some tenants and he kept sending messengers to the tenants, i.e. the prophets, and they would, uh, they would reject the message of the prophets. And finally, he sent his son saying, they will listen to my son. And that's obviously Jesus. And they killed him and sent him out of the vineyard. So sometimes these parables you know, are very timely. Jesus is talking to those people who would have ears to hear about their rejection of him and the judgment that would come. Remember, Isaiah said, I'm going to send you these, these people aren't going to listen. And because they won't listen, this judgment would, would eventually come on them. Okay? And so these, some of the parables that are about Jesus and His ministry, the stone that the builders has rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So some of this is connected with the judgment on the temple for their widespread lack of accepting Jesus and his ways okay so I'll just leave that there so sometimes if you can't figure out what a parable is think about where Jesus is in his ministry okay all right 21 to 23 what's going on there He likens the seed spreading to uh, like a, a light uh, that you don't put under a basket. Okay. Basically, if you want light in the room, okay. uh, you don't cover it up. Or, uh, who goes to Menards and buys a torch lamp and immediately puts it in the closet? Yeah. That's what he's saying here, right? Sower went forth to sow. Seed is for sowing. Lamps are for lighting. Okay. Uh, anything you know, and one of the functions of the word is to bring things to light. Okay. When Ronald Reagan was buried, 
on television, <clears throat> whoever did the officiating compared him to the, the, the temple on the hill with the light. Oh, a lighthouse? Yeah, well, no. It, it, the oh, the lamp that was shining on, on the burial of Jesus. Oh, huh. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> so he finishes it there. So this is a little snippet. And he said, lamp is brought into front of the bat. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you not use a lamp, is what he's saying. Then if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So that's the second time he said it in this chapter. What's going on in 24 to 25? Just telling them to, you know, <laughs> to consider and think about what you've hear, heard, um, and also that, you know, another way of putting this is, uh, it, as you judge, so you will, sh so you will be judged. You will be judged by this measure or the standard you set. And that's something that he would say, maybe in, maybe in the Sermon on the Mount as well. Maybe also in the Sermon on the Plain. Okay, pay attention, listen up. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Isaiah said that some people will not hear, and that will redound to their judgment and their disadvantage. Listen and hear. Uh, and finally, he says about, and I think this is interesting because it almost seems counterintuitive, but he says, "Whoever has more will be given to them, and whoever." <laughs> doesn't have even what Lily has will be taken. That's from the parable of the uh, talents. Because that's what the master says at the end, that take the talent away from the guy that buried it and give it to the guy that, you know, doubled his, the talents I gave him. Because that, they know how to use it. In other words, the people that know how and will use, properly use the gifts of God, they're the ones that should be given it. And it almost sounds like they are increasing 30, 60, and 100 fold, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like if you, if, you listen, if you hear it and you understand it, then you need to act on it. Lamps are for lighting, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Lamps are for lighting to do it. Okay, what's going on 26 to 29? How does this, uh, what, somebody with the NIV read that, read verse 26 there. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Okay. Uh, King Jamesy people, what have you got? And he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man okay. should cast seed into the ground. Okay. Sometimes in the, in the Gospels, you've got kingdom of God, and I think it's primarily in Luke where he says kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the same thing. It's just that heaven was used as a marker, as a, uh, another name for God. Not that you would say, Oh dear heaven, right? Mm -hmm. To pray to God, you would, you'd say God, okay? But when yeah. we read that, I think you read it, and it said, I think it said heaven in twenty six. King, Kingdom of God, it says. Uh, oh, New, New King James. Okay, sorry, I missed. I missed. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because this says that, like, there's a. We are responsible as servants of God for doing the sowing, or not the sowing. Yeah, sowing the sowing and. You know, doing these other things, but it's God that causes the growth. Okay. Okay. But then we have to be there to reap when the growth has has you know produced. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this parable is again about a man scattering seeds on the ground. Okay. Just like earlier in the chapter. But then what does he do? He cuts it down. Hmm? <laughs> he cuts it. Well, when it's time, when it harvests, yeah. right? But it doesn't matter what he does. <laughs> After he scatters the seed, what does he do? Yeah. He, goes he goes to sleep. Yeah. Right? And I imagine that even with our Monsanto and all our intelligence, that we can say, soil need, for this peanut, the soil needs to have this pH content, it needs to have this much sun, and it needs to have this much water. But then when it says, then when you ask this person, how exactly does the seed sprout? They're going to go like, I don't know. <laughs> we can tell you about all the conditions, but it just is. 
Why does the sky look blue? Because the water, you know, the moisture refracting makes it look blue. But why blue? Uh, it just does. I mean, eventually you get to the ceiling of your knowledge, and that's what this is doing. The, sky, the seed sower goes forth, he scatters the seed, he does his job. That's his job. The growth comes not with him or her. Now, obviously, the implication is the growth comes from God. God, right? Did you have something? No. Okay. Um, so this is about the scattering and the harvest. And again, when the grain is ripe, full grain in the ear, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Some of the parables talk about um, this man lending the vineyard and he comes to get some of the fruit from it. And there's no fruit. Why? Because Israel is fruitless, right? Okay. So this is a, a thing about the work of the scatterer doing the scattering, but the seed has something in it that is independent of the scattering. So the thing that I thought of is people will often say, uh, work like it all depends on you, and pray and sleep like it all depends on God. That's pretty good, I think. All right? What's going on 30 to 34? It's another parable. Small to big, right? Small to big. That's what's going on. Grain and mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Jesus is speaking in ordinary language, right? Atheists will come along and say, ha ha! He didn't know about the poppy seed or whatever it is, right? <laughs> okay, so when your friend is like that, and they say, well, the sun went down, you say, aha! <laughs> It's actually the earth that's moving, right? We understand the speech act that Jesus is involved with here, right? He's not making a botanistic taxonomy thing. He says, you know these little itty-bitties? It's, hey, this is the smallest thing we know about. Speaking in hyperbole. Yeah, because it's like the seed, the mustard seed is, has been created by God to be this little tiny thing but then when it grows, it becomes this huge tree. Disproportionate. And, and so the kingdom of God is just like that because <coughs> God intended it that way, that it would start out small, but that it would, God's you know, going to make it grow. Someday, Tony had... I have it on right now. Oh, you yeah. have it on? Yeah, I have. And I remarked about it, I said... The mountains, is that from Colorado? And she said, look closer, there's a little mustard seed. Oh, you got a mustard seed pin. I have a mustard seed with <laughs> nice. the mountains. Yeah. Nice. My mother, that's one thing I remember from my mother, because she, did, she always used this and talked about this with the mustard seed. Yep. Yeah. So, so Jesus it blows would... your mind yeah. to see that little thing. And you wonder, how does it sprout? Yeah, It just does. Because know. that's how God created it to do, right? Yeah. So Jesus would also talk about faith as small as a mustard seed. So he uses the mustard seed at least twice, one in describing faith, one in describing the kingdom. Here it's describing the kingdom. This little itty bitty seed has an outsized effect. So this is a picture of a guy, I think in Israel, standing by a mustard plant. I found some things that looked like real tree trees, and I was kind of like, I don't know, I want to, I want to try to show you as accurate as possible. But you could see how a bird, you know, you drive by and there's those little blackbirds that sit on those little things, and you're like, how can it sit on there, right? Yeah. Right here. But so you could see how a bird can sit in this bush, this mustard bush. Um, and so here, the uh, small to big. And there is, there's another, so the kingdom growing from small to big. Now, at that time, he had called 12 disciples. Small now there's a lot of disciples, right? Now, there had been faithful before Jesus, right? But at that time, by comparison, all the scribe, most of the scribes and Pharisees are rejecting Jesus, and Jesus is reconstituting Israel around himself. And it's a little group. It's a little flock. You are my little ones, is what he calls them. 
Okay? And then what we have now is that all the way in Lake County, Illinois, we've got disciples of Jesus meeting on a Tuesday morning. Okay? So, um, so Ezekiel 47 talks about this, this eschatological temple and there's a little trickle of water that comes out from it. And if you read Ezekiel 47, the further out it gets away from the temple, the deeper it gets. And that's what this picture is. That's a picture of the kingdom. A little trickle there. A little itty bitty baby born in a backwater town named Bethlehem growing up, calling these 12 around him, the 70, the 500 that saw him at his resurrection going to the ends of the earth. That's God's kingdom. <coughs> now we're engaged in little skirmishes here and there and we feel like it's winning or losing on a daily basis, right? But overall, the earth will one day be filled with the glory of the Lord and people worshiping Him who have bowed the knee either out of adoration or out of sheer terror. And the, the, the overlap between heaven and earth will be complete, whereas right now it's a little bit like this, right? So the kingdom is growing. And so with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. I'm going to speak publicly. And this is also, remember early in Mark, he's saying, I'm doing these things, but don't tell anybody. So it kind of works in conjunction with that. You know, This is kind of the secret thing where, where those whom the Spirit clears out their ears will be able to hear. Right? Okay, so then uh, the ending there, they go across to the other side, they get in this boat, and the great wind comes, and what do they, what do they say to him there in 38? <laughs> so one of, the, one of the commentaries that I read that said Jesus has to endure this from his own disciples, right? Teacher, don't you care? And so that's part of his... A state of humiliation, right? Jesus, the Word, was with the Father eternally, and He came and confined Himself to the body of a baby who had to fall when He was walking and had to learn how to speak and had to be obedient to Joseph and Mary. This is part of His state of, hu of humiliation. His own disciples turning on Him and not trusting Him fully, right? This is part of His humiliation, dying on a cross. But His state of exaltation is Him raising up and being seated at the right hand of God. So, here we've got the disciples, His own disciples, who were, you can make the case, that the Father had given the Son these disciples as a, as a gift. Right? Saying, don't you care? And he gets up and He says, Peace be still. And there was great calm. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. What, what was amazing to them about this? You know, we're, we're blown by it in 45 seconds, but what was amazing to them? Well, he talked and it happened. <laughs> he just spoke to the wind and the waves, and they said, yeah, they just yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The air columns had met their maker. The molecules of H2 and O, the molecules of H and O, have met their maker. Mm -hmm. And with a word, they obey Him. Now in the disciples' mind, who can do that? God. God. Only the same one that parted the waters of the Red Sea with a strong east wind, or whatever the wind was, right? Mm -hmm. So they're getting little glimpses here and there. Who can do this? The implication is, only the Lord from the Old Testament can do this. John, go and prepare the way of the Lord. And here comes the Lord sitting in a boat, getting up, going, ah, okay, 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 okay. Just stop it. Who can do this? Only the Lord of mysteries and riddles, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord who is coming. All right, so parables, sometimes people get it, sometimes they don't. The parable of the soil, 
we're praying that uh, the, the seed that we scatter, we're praying that we would scatter the seed. We would not be discouraged when we see it falling on those other soils, those other types of soils. That it will, we pray that the Lord would increase His Word in us 30, 60, 100 fold. We pray that we would be encouraged that at the end of time, the glory of the Lord has filled the earth. And we are thankful that the Lord of the wind and the waves was in the boat that day with them and who would later give His life for them. So uh, let me pray for us. Father, we thank You for these words from Jesus. Father, we pray that Your Spirit would always clean our ears out so that we would hear. And Father, where we are perplexed like the disciples, we ask that You would uh, cause us to come to You and ask what these things mean. But Father, we are very thankful that the plain things are the plain things. Father, we pray that You would unstop the ears of our friends, our relatives, our co-workers, our neighbors, and even our enemies so that they might hear the words of Jesus, that we might be eager to sow them and uh, scatter them about and let uh, You do Your work for the harvest. Cause us to scatter and plant and water. Uh, we thank You for the Lord Jesus, and we ache and long for the day when His glory has filled the, <coughs> the entire world. And we ask that, that would be soon. Uh, we ask that You would make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to trust Your promises and serve our neighbors more. And we ask the same thing for those folks that join us by video and have joined us here at the table in times past, that You would uh, work in us and through us until the day that Jesus returns. And it's in His name we pray these things. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you all.